Our Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the wonderful privilege that we have of fellowship together to worship you and to feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit be the one who reveals truth to us and strips away that which is foolish and ignorant. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in our last study, we'd reached the 7th verse of chapter 11. The 11th chapter is a marvelous illustration of God's sovereign dealings with people and with the nations of this earth. The 10th chapter ended with the possibility of one assuming that God wants something to happen that He can't bring to pass, and that as a result of that, he's, he's going to cast away his people. And the 11th chapter assures us that, first of all, what has happened with Israel has been designed by God. And secondly, he has no intention whatsoever of casting them away. We found that there was an election according to grace, and it has to be grace. If you add anything to grace, well, it's no longer grace. And if you try to mix grace and works, well, you've destroyed both of them. And we had the strong exhortation that if it's grace, it's no more works. And if it's works, it's no more grace. And the language, folks, is absolutely emphatic and specific. Then we got to the seventh verse. Israel didn't obtain what they sought for, and I pointed out that that surely a characteristic of the nation of Israel was to seek after God that anyone who studies the history of Israel knows. But the election obtained it, and the rest were blinded. And I pointed out that the word there for blinded might better be, be better rendered made stubborn or hardened. I think the King James is probably the only one that renders it blinded. It isn't that that that's a poor translation, but I think the context might look better with the word hardened. I mean, that is the word in the original Greek. And then we have the 8th, ninth, and 10th verses, which are quotes from Isaiah and from the Psalms. And we can reach a couple of conclusions there. Verse 8, according as it has been written, it's a perfect passive as it normally is, that it was written in past time exactly the way God wanted. It's complete and it stands written. The passive voice indicates that Moses or David or Isaiah were not the authors, but that God was the author. God had given them the spirit of stupor or slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Now, that's a quote from Isaiah, and then he goes to the Psalms. As David also said, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. The last two verses, uh, the ninth and tenth verses, are in the imperative mood. Those are aorist passive imperatives. They didn't make their table a snare. They didn't blind their eyes. So we, with the passive, we need an operator. And when, when we have the passive voice, we have to decide who the operator is, and I believe clearly it's God. It is God who gave them a spirit of stupor or slumber. It's God who gave them eyes that they couldn't see, and it's God that gave them ears that they should not hear unto this day. I believe these are prophetic statements. God said, this is true of Israel. I did this, and I made their table a snare and a trap. The word trap being that which is used to trap game, and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. And I don't see how you can get anything out of this other than, the, uh, than that it that a sovereign God says this is what he intended to do with his people. 
can he not do with his people as he pleases? And you have to answer that one way or another. We know that the typical evangelical position is that yes, election occurs in the Word of God. Well, I, I'll, I'll grant you there are many who don't believe in election at all. But the typical position is that yeah, yeah, election's there in the Bible, but actually God holds out salvation to everybody. And by salvation, they mean redemption. We're going to see in just a little bit here in this chapter, a few verses ahead, that Paul is willing to do almost anything that he might save some of his people, Israel, of Israel. We don't save anybody. Not if it's redemption. Paul isn't saying there that he wants to redeem them. He wants to see them delivered, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a moment. What God is doing with His people, He's doing by design, and we see that by that design, deliverance came also to the Gentile. Obviously, it couldn't come through the law, so God said that they weren't going to see and they weren't going to hear. The normal Christian position is that God offers redemption to everybody. But, you know, now let's take a moment to, to think about that. Because God is sovereignly dealing with His people here in this text. There's, there are any number of Bible teachers who believe wholeheartedly in the total depravity of man that he can't hear, he can't come, he can't receive, he can't believe. All of those scriptures would indicate that man in his natural state is totally depraved. Any number of Christians, and, and, and I realize there's a great departure from total depravity, but any number of Christians believe that man is totally depraved, but, but God holds out salvation to every man. And what we're saying then is we really don't believe in total depravity. What we're saying is that redemption, and they always infer redemption when they use the word salvation, we're saying that redemption in the last analysis is man's decision, and folks, that's a terrible step. Redemption is not managed decision. It's not of human volition. We are born by the will of God, not by our will, not by the will of the flesh, nor by the will of man, but by the will of God. And we really believe that God is holding out, you know, a, a, He's holding out an opportunity to everybody. We're saying then that we are contradictory. And as I pointed out, the word gainsaying actually means contradictive, contradicting. We are gainsaying people. We're saying you're not born by the will of God. The reason you're not born is because you didn't do something. And we've suddenly become inconsistent in our theology. And I spoke a little bit about that, that being inconsistent in my previous video. God has the sovereign right to do with His own as He pleases, folks. And for God to give the command that they have a spirit of slumber, they're going to have it. They're going to have it. What I want you to see in 8, 9, and 10, verses 8, 9, and 10, is that God has sovereignly dealt with Israel. These passages all deal with Israel, and to argue that Israel is a nation is, is not the subject. People often say, especially nowadays, you know, Israel's been folded into the church and that we're now looking here at the church. You know, we're talking about His people whom He foreknew. And I believe this firmly, that if God does not fulfill His promises to, natu to national Israel, folks, if He doesn't do that, I have no confidence that He'll fulfill His purposes to me, His promises to me. And it's difficult for anyone to go through the 11th chapter of Romans and still contend that God has nothing to do with Israel anymore, that Israel's been folded into the church. God says He did something with Israel, and we have to accept that as the sovereign God He is. He gave them a spirit of slumber. He gave them eyes that could not see. He gave them ears that could not hear. And He made their table their food, 
a stumbling block and a snare and a trap. And that's, a, that's what the law was to Israel and a recompense unto them. Their eyes were darkened that they couldn't see and their backs were bowed down under the law always. That was God's design. And there was a purpose in that design to show that by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. And they couldn't see that. They were persuaded that by the works of the law, flesh was justified, even though God declared in Habakkuk that the justified man lives by God's faithfulness. Now, there's many that believe that that's man's faithfulness there. You have to study the text, folks. I believe these three quotes are prophecies, and I believe that they are as true today as they were in the day in, in which they were written. That this is still true of national Israel, and that God is speaking prophetically in the book of Isaiah and in the Psalms, that this is how He has dealt with Israel. Verse 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, the word is, is trespass. Salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Interesting verse. I say then, have they stumbled? And they, they stumbled is an aorist. We're, and we're not is a one-time thing. And we're not looking at individual people. Has the nation stumbled, trespassed, that they should fall? The word fall is the Greek word pipto, the Greek word that means to fall down. May it never be, God forbid, or of course not, but rather through their fall. And now the word is, 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 is uh, uh, paraptoma, a word that means to sidestep. It's actually a word that means to sidestep. However, in, in my translation, the words are all translated the same. Have they stumbled in order that they should fall down completely? Oh, may, ne may it never be. May it never be. But rather, through their sidestep, if you have a modern translation, it probably says transgression. That is the normal Greek word for transgression. So their sidestep or transgression, and the word salvation is articulated, the salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy, not to provoke the Gentiles to jealousy, but to provoke Israel. And again, we have to decide what salvation means in this particular context. And I've spent some time talking about that distinction. If we say that through the sidestepping or the transgression of Israel, redemption came to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy, I don't think the text makes any sense if we're, if we're going to be consistent with the Word of God. I think we have to believe that redemption is the paying of a price. Israel didn't pay that price. Paul didn't pay that price. Christ paid that price. To me, at least, it's, it's inconceivable to separate redemption, ransom, from the finished work of Christ. And that requires some consideration over the matter of whether Christ dying on the cross was, well, was substitutionary or not. I've gone to churches and I've listened to ministers preach and I'll read their statement of faith. Most churches have one. And in, in any number of cases, I've picked up a statement of faith that says, we believe in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, but the sermon has not been substitutionary at all. Because they'll say that Christ died for everyone, and the picture is that we have we have a huge sum of money that Christ paid, and, and anybody that wills can come and take enough, kind of take enough money out of that bucket, you know, to pay his sin debt. And folks, that is not substitutionary. You can make two great divisions in Christianity. One is that Christ died provisionally, or that Christ died substitutionally, which is the position of this ministry. It's always been the position of this ministry. Christ died in your place. You cannot die. Therefore, the paying of that price, which we call redemption, ransom, was totally separate from you. 
It was not based on any decision that you made or anything that you did. It was simply the fact that Jesus Christ died in your place. As you were in Adam made sinners, so you were in Christ made righteous. And it's not biblical to separate the ransom or the price paid in redemption to make it something that has to do with you. Here is a text, folks, that says that through their stumbling or transgression, the salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, we could argue, I suppose, that the Jews found out the Gentiles are redeemed, and so that made them jealous. But that does something that's not fair with the concept of redemption. I would like to read that, that, that through their fall, the deliverance is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Many assume that salvation includes the entire concept of all that God has done for us in Christ, but that won't fit a lot of passages of Scripture. It might fit some of them, but it, don't, it won't fit all of them. And it doesn't, it, it just, if it doesn't fit all of them, it seems to me that we have to at least modify slightly what we think is involved when the Holy Spirit speaks of saved in salvation. I've suggested this to you before. I just want you to think about it. Please don't agree with me. You know, maybe the Lord's got me here teaching error to force you to study. I don't know. I, I know I don't want to teach error. What I do want to do, though, is be consistent, folks, with this book. And it's difficult for me to take one word and, and dump into it many different theological concepts that I see in the Word of God. I've spent years looking at written systematic theologies early on in my Bible uh, college days. I've kind of devoured them. And, and what I've seen is that salvation becomes the catch term that includes all of the various aspects of, of the finished work of, of Christ. How can Paul then say that he wants to save some of them? How, how would you feel if God appeared to you, spoke to you vividly as he speaks in his word? I've had any number of people say that they, they, they'd really believe in God if He'd just reveal Himself you know, to them. Well, He has in His Word. Now, I mean, this may come as a shock to some of you, but I want this book more than I want a physical, visible appearance of Jesus Christ to talk to me. Because I have His complete Word. And I think it's a marvelous thing to be able to study the Word of God. Folks, I am of the mind that if Christ Himself was here today, He wouldn't have anything to say to us that He hasn't already said in His Word. Paul is interested in spreading the good news that Jesus Christ has died for your sins, buried and risen again. And God comes to him and says, Paul, I have a lot of people in that city. And, and so Paul goes into Corinth to preach salvation. Is it conceivable that he's preaching redemption. If God has a lot of people in that city who are redeemed, who are his, they're already redeemed. I would read that passage of scripture. You know, Paul, I have redeemed people in that city and I'm sending you there. Well, he's surely not sending him there to redeem them. And no missionary goes to the missionary field to redeem anybody, but to bring them the good news that they are redeemed and his sheep will hear. And if they believe, they are his sheep. So, I have the salvation. And I'm interested in, in why it's articulated. The salvation. Through their stumbling or transgression. The word really means to fall alongside. By their falling alongside, the deliverance or salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them, the Israelites, to jealousy. Boy, God is dealing with the Gentiles. We, you know, we thought it was only through Israel. You need to realize that for any Gentile to come to Jehovah, he had to do it through a Jewish priest. Until Christ died and rent the veil, now our mediator is Christ Jesus, the Lord. What I'm seeing here, folks, is God's concern for Israel, whom he redeemed, that they be delivered, not redeemed. And what I am seeing is God's concern for His people, the Gentiles, whom He's redeemed, that they might be delivered. Are you getting that? 
I have to be consistent with the word, looking carefully at the context. We have a first class condition in the 12th verse. Now if, that is since, the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So we can't say that God did anything wrong in giving Israel a spirit of slumber, and eyes that couldn't see, and ears that couldn't hear. If as a result of that, it was the riches of the world system and the diminishing of them were, were the riches of the nations, how much more their fullness. I mean, folks, look at the implication of the 12th verse. We have to do something with their completeness or their fullness. The fullness of Israel could be the fact that the Gentiles fill them up. We're soon going to read that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. That's verse 25. And now we have Israel's fullness here. So we have a completeness of Israel in verse 12 and the completeness of the Gentiles in verse 25. And I don't want to get these mixed up and, and jump ahead to verse 25, but there's an opinion among the covenant theologians at least that the fullness or completeness of Israel and the completeness of the Gentiles are one and the same thing. And that is that Israel has been folded into the church and therefore this expression speaks of the church. It seems to me it's difficult in our present context to suggest that the fullness of Israel is their dissolution that no longer do we have Israel. It's now the church. We have a context that's, that almost demands that whatever Israel was in the past is going to be again. And it's difficult to say that there was a sidestepping of them and a diminishing of them which resulted in riches to the Gentiles and now there's going to be a, a fullness of those who had sidestepped and been diminished. That doesn't say that they don't exist anymore, that we, sh that we shouldn't speak of Israel, but that we now only speak of the church. I mean, to me, the 12th verse is an outstanding, uh, simple statement that Israel is going to be restored. They're, they're going to become complete. So, so much for the, the idea of replacement theology, which today is becoming more and more popular by the minute. Just like this rain and uh, thunderstorms are becoming, they seem to be becoming more and more unpopular by the minute. No, folks, it's going to happen someday. I believe it's a prophetic passage of Scripture. Y'all may not like hearing me say this, but I believe with all of my heart that 40 million Arabs could annihilate Israel today and the nation of Israel cease to exist and Jews scattered throughout the world again for another thousand years. I mean, that still wouldn't change my conviction that eventually God's going to restore Israel not only to of spiritual completeness, but to the land He promised them. And so I think the 12th verse is a prophetic verse speaking of the fact that God is still sovereignly dealing with Israel. And that's going to be enhanced with verses uh, that we continue to study. We'll find that the Gentiles were grafted in. Well, don't become proud. The Gentiles might be cut off and Israel grafted back in. And all of those, all of, all of these texts indicate that God's not through with the nation. I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Paul declared that because the Jews wouldn't hear, he'd go to the Gentiles. But he's speaking to the Gentiles and he's telling them that there is yet to be a fullness of Israel. One of the things that that, that Gentiles could do very easily is say God has abandoned Israel. That's not God's plan. He's not cast away His people whom He foreknew. Well, I'm out of time. I uh, love you all. I truly do. Stand strong, folks, in the love and the grace that God has for you. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.